Our presentation today will start with Jason Caldwell, who is one of the co-founders here at RevRoad. He's our COO and an incredible leader. Uh, he's had quite a, an incredible journey in his career, uh, first working with military intelligence. Uh, he's a uh, fluent Arab uh, linguist and uh, also fluent in Italian and has worked on a number of top secret projects that he could tell you about and then he'd have to kill you and uh, worked with a lot of different government um, contracting agencies to do some really, really amazing things. Um, as a veteran, uh, he's done a lot to help provide safety for all of us. And so I'm super grateful to have the chance to work with him every day. And he's going to um, share something, a presentation on something called, Are You a Fox or a Hedgehog? Then we'll have the Builder Series, and we're super thrilled to have Evan Gentry here. Uh, he's flown here from Southern California, and he's from G8 Capital and M360 Advisors. He's also the executive chairman at Sold.com and uh, just a very successful serial entrepreneur. He's also the dad of our very own Parker Gentry, the founder and CEO of Skillstruck. So we're really excited to hear him. And then we'll share an, uh, a teaser video for Revview next month. So with that, I think, let's welcome to the stage Jason Caldwell. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, it's really nice to see you here. I feel like I'm with uh, 20 of my best friends, because if the CDC asks, there's 20 people here. Um, and, and I love that everybody's wearing a mask. Thank you for doing that um, and, and just looking out for other people that are around you. With the masks, I can't tell you know, if you're smiling or laughing. I'll be able to, you are making great eye contact, by the way. I appreciate that. But if you're asleep, I'll be able to tell that. So if I, if I say something funny or witty, just like, do snaps or do something to let me know that I'm on the right track. All right, so um, probably about now you're wondering why is this guy holding a dog in a Halloween costume up here on stage? This is not a dog. This is a fox. La Volpe. So I'm going to tell you a story. It's an ancient Greek parable. It was written by this guy, Archilochus, and he told the story of a fox and a hedgehog. Now the fox you know, is a sleek animal, right? Cunning, beautiful, looks like a winner, really smart. You know, we have that saying, sly like a fox, and we have that for a reason. So the fox is out in the woods, it's a predator, wants to eat things, and he sees a hedgehog, and he wants to eat that, or she, sorry, she, wants to eat that hedgehog, because it just looks like a tasty morsel. So the fox, being as smart as it, as it is, just goes up to the hedgehog, sneaks up on it, and tries to pounce and eat the hedgehog. But now we're going to find out how the hedgehog responds to that. Can you hold that? I got to have gloves. Okay. This. Yep. There we go. This is Peaches the hedgehog. We have an all female troop today, except for me. Um, so here's the hedgehog. She's trundling along looking for stuff to eat. She's really good at what she does. And this is what she does. She curls up in a little ball and just presents all these awesome spikes. So the fox, when the fox goes to eat the hedgehog, finds out that that's not super awesome, right? But the fox sees this little kind of rat-looking thing and wants to eat it. So the fox, being super smart, says, well, the next day, I'm going to ambush it and see what happens. So the fox lays in wait, ambushes it. Once again, the hedgehog just looks at the fox, says whatever, and curls up in a little ball, presents all these spikes. So the fox is like, well, no, I can, I can, get, I can get through this. I can eat this thing. So the next day, the fox decides on a new tactic and jumps out at the hedgehog to try to um, scare it so, and catch it by surprise. But the hedgehog just looks at the fox and says, nope. Curling up in a ball, here's the spikes. So this happens day after day. The fox comes up with a new tactic or a new strategy or a new approach to try to eat this hedgehog. And this little hedgehog, all she does is curl up in a ball and present her spikes. And she wins every time. She beats that fox, no matter how smart he is, no matter how many different tactics or different strategies that fox employs, that hedgehog wins. Because the hedgehog... I need my clicker. 
the hedgehog, so the fox knows how to do many things, but the hedgehog knows how to do one big thing, and that beats the fox every time. Okay, so that's the, the parable, and that's the moral to the parable or the fable. Um, so we're going to fast forward now to the 1950s. There was this philosopher, thinker, essayist, Isaiah Berlin, and he took that parable and he broke people down into two categories, foxes or hedgehogs. And that's where the name of the presentation comes from. Are you a fox or are you a hedgehog? I got lots of good laughs from my staff on that, from my team. Uh, they thought I was crazy. But you're going to see how this, how this uh, plays out. So are you a fox or you're a hedgehog? So foxes are people that um, pursue all sorts of stuff at the same time. They see the world in all its complexity. They have a different stra strategy or a different tactic to try to get what they want. In fact, sometimes foxes, if they're bored, you know, they're tired of doing the same thing again and again, they'll change it up just to see what can happen. Now, on the other hand, hedgehogs, they have one unifying vision. Uh, they, they break everything down into a principle or a vision or a concept that they're going to follow. And then everything that they do will feed into that vision or feed into that concept. And they get really good at it. And anything that doesn't feed into that concept, they just aren't going to waste their time on it. They're going to issue that. And so they get really good at that one thing, and everything they do goes, goes towards that. So that's Isaiah Berlin. He broke it down that way. Now we're going to fast forward again to Jim Collins. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the book Good to Great. So part of uh, his study that he did, he was looking at companies that were good and then those companies that made the leap to be, leap to be great companies. And he was trying to figure out what uh, they did in, in order to become great companies. And one of the things along that journey was these companies that went great developed a hedgehog concept. Uh, they did one thing, they did it really well, and everything they did in their business, every decision they make, every activity they undertook, fed into that vision so that they could become great. Okay? All right, so how do we find our hedgehog concept? A lot of us, we, you know, we're, we're business owners, business leaders here, so how do we find our hedgehog concept? There's three questions or three circles that we're going to put up on the board, and we're going to use these three circles in order to, to zoom in on our hedgehog concept. So the first one is, what are you deeply passionate about? So if we can find our passion, that's going to get us closer to that hedgehog concept, okay? And it's not necessarily what you're passionate about, like right now, but it's what can you get passionate about. It's, it's kind of a fine distinction, but it's what can you get passionate about um, that we can do for work. So uh, I'll, I'll quote Steve Jobs here, right? Everybody knows Apple. Everybody's aware of what they produce and what the companies become. But geez, Steve Jobs, he said, Apple is not about making boxes for people to get their jobs done, although we do that well. Apple is about something more. Its core value is that we believe in, the, in that people with passion can change the world for better. So Steve Jobs wasn't necessarily passionate about making computers or iPads or iPhones. He was passionate about getting tools into people's hands so they could unleash their creativity. And that's what fired his passion. And then he was able to use that to motivate others um, to get that same passion. Um, another example is Howard Schultz of um, Starbucks. Uh, in interviews, he, he doesn't necessarily reference coffee because Starbucks isn't about coffee. Anybody can make a cup of coffee. What he was passionate about was getting that place in between home and work that people could go to and spend some time in, get work done, and, and be comfortable. So coffee was a product, but the experience is what he was passionate about and what he was selling. So you got to find what you're deeply passionate about, and then we'll put that up in a circle on the board. All right, so that's the first question we need to answer. The second question we need to answer is what you can be best in the world at. Okay? Um, and this is a really interesting topic, and that is our presentation power-up. So we're going to go to our crack railroad analyst, Seth Robinson. Where is he? Seth. He's thought a lot about this, so he is going to talk about what we can be best in the world at. AJ put this in his uh, presentation last month, and for whatever reason, Jason decided to resurrect it. Well, I, I upped it because now you have a sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> so the real power in knowing what you're the best at doesn't necessarily come from knowing what you're best at. What it does is it allows you to eliminate everything else, and that's where the real power of knowing what you're best at comes from. 
And it's not even about knowing how to become best at that, but surely knowing what you can become best at drives and focuses your operations to such a degree where the question you're answering is, does this make me better at this thing I can be the best in the world at? And if not, we can eliminate it, we can move on. The thing that gets people bogged down with this is they think that um, their core competency is what they're best in the world at. And it needs to be, that needs to be the case, but a lot of times it isn't. If you have a competitor that can be better at your core competency, then understanding and knowing what you can be best at and developing that needs to be a completely different process, it needs to be something completely different. And so just like Starbucks, they sell coffee. That's how they make money, but that's not what they're best in the world at. They're best in the world at creating this third place. So that's, that's, my, that's my input here. The power in knowing what you're the best in the world at is admitting what you are not best at and letting the rest go. Developing and refining that single aspect is really where, where this, this shines. Cool, thank you, Seth. And Starbucks is really good at getting you to pay $10 for a cup of coffee. So they got that going for them as well. So now we're going to put that circle up there, and you can see where we're starting to have some overlap. We're going to have a Venn diagram here at some point. So now you're passionate about something, and you can be best in the world at it. Think back to that hedgehog, right? It's got one function. It rolls up in a ball, and it's the best at that. Quick example of this is Tesla, right? Everybody knows Tesla uh, is aware of what they're doing. They started out to become the biggest car company in the world. That's, one of their, that's their big goal, right? And they kind of went around it backwards. Usually when you do a startup, um, you do an MVP or an MVP, minimum viable product, right? You get it out there, you get testers, you try to improve it, you try to do better. Um, with this car company, they didn't start down at the bottom, right? They didn't try to take over the, that 30,000 and under segment because it'd be really hard to compete. So they made a big splash with the Tesla Roadster. And if you got 200K, I would, I would buy that car. Um, that's where they started. Now they're going back and adding those other models to try to take that over. And we know Tesla just, just recently became the, the most valuable car company. So not necessarily the biggest, but they're definitely the most valuable right now, beating out GM even. So, so they're well on their way. They found what they can be passionate about. They found what they can be best at the world at. Okay, the third question now that we need to answer is because businesses exist to make money, right? So what drives your economic engine? How are you going to make money? And the way that we answer this question is you have to find, we call it the, the denominator, your economic denominator. You're looking for profit per X. How much money can I make for this specific item? Um, in good to great, the example was Walgreens. Um, you would think, you know, their price per customer or profit per customer would be their uh, denominator, but they actually figured out that their denominator is profit per customer visit. So the idea there then, now we have this economic driver, we know the decisions we need to make in order to maximize that, which is get people in the store more often. So now Walgreens is on every corner and they're opening up more stores and there's even like a nine, there was like nine stores in a mile stretch or something like that. Because the more they can get you in, the more money they make. And that's what they figured out what their denominator is. And you can look at that at several different ways. One of the easiest ways is just revenue per customer or profit per customer. You can break it down and find out how much money you get from each customer. And then all the decisions you make would be around, do I increase the amount of purchasing or transaction from that customer or the number of transactions per customer? And then you can make those decisions once you figure out what that denominator is. So now that we have these three questions and we ask them, you'll see that really cool red road blue area in the middle that gets us into our hedgehog concept. So we find what we're passionate about, we find what we can be best in the world at, and then we find out what drives our economic engine, and we found our hedgehog. Super simple, right? Really easy? No, okay. So getting to the hedgehog concept. Um, this is an iterative process, and I've had problems with saying that word, iterative. It means we're gonna do it again and again, right? And keep honing in on that concept. Who's familiar with uh, E equals MC squared? You guys ever heard that one before? I see a couple hands. Not many, really? Most of you haven't heard of that formula, theory of special relativity, Einstein? It took Einstein 10 years to develop that theory. So it's not something that you get overnight. It's not an aha moment. 
for a business. It's not a, a weekend offsite where you pull out flip charts and have a couple of discussions, and all of a sudden, you know, you've answered those three questions and you found your hedgehog. On average, the great companies took about four years to clarify what their hedgehog was. So you got to try some different things to get there. So that's what we're going to go to now is how do we do that. So we want to start with the council. And that sounds super ominous, um, especially with uh, the industry I came from before this, the council. But you can call it whatever you want. This is a group of people uh, that you designate. The, the, usually the executive leadership will get together in your business so that they can look at those three questions and try to answer them. And they do it on a periodic basis so that they can continually hone in on that. All right, so the council um, should be uh, assembled by the leading executive. You can have any number of people you want. Five to 12 people is about the norm, depending on the size of your, of your business. Each member should be able to argue and debate um, what they see in the company and what they see the way to go, depending on those three circles. Uh, each member should have respect for each other because there's going to be a lot of um, discussion and disagreement in this group. So they should be able to respect each other at the end of the day to listen and, and to argue their point of view. Um, members should come from a range of different uh, areas of your business. So you can see all aspects of your business within this council because somebody over on this side may have a different viewpoint of what the customer uh, is going through than this person over on the other side of the business. Um, key members of management should be part of that group, but they don't necessarily have to be in there. Um, an, an executive shouldn't automatically be in that group. You can decide uh, for your council who should be in that. It could be you know, a frontline worker because they interact with the customers, so they may have a much better uh, viewpoint of what's going on and some great input there. Uh, it's a standing body. You, need to, uh, you don't have to make it formal. It's an informal group, but you do need to know they have that responsibility. And then they should be able to vigorously debate and discuss these issues uh, that come up. But at the end of the day, you need decisions to come out of there. And those decisions should be made by an executive. So there should be one final authority that makes decisions out of that group. And um, don't look for consensus in that group either, because then you can get caught up in groupthink. So your, your goal of that group is not to reach a consensus on a direction. It's just to debate the different areas and aspects of your business. Okay, so how do they do that? So the council gets together. They're gonna ask questions, always guided by those three circles. Okay, so that's the first part. Second part is now they're gonna dialogue and debate that back and forth, um, discuss what they should do and how they should do it. And then executive decisions need to be made out of that council. So somebody needs to take that authority and put it into action by making decisions. And then you do autopsies and analysis. So uh, one of the, once you make a decision, you have to measure, you have to uh, figure out if that decision worked or not, and if you need to change what direction you're going. One of the things that we do here at RevRoad is, is called an AAR. And if you were in the military, you know what an after action review is. Uh, it's a real simple formula that you can do pretty much after every action. Um, in the military, it was about, like, the, the most ones I did were at the squad and platoon level, which is four to eight people, so a squad, their objective in a battle is to take a hill. So they would take that hill, and then they could sit down right there once, once the battle's over and do an after-action review. And it's a real simple formula, which is what was the plan going in, so how were we going to take that hill, how did we plan to do it? Then it's what actually happened, because we all know that no plan survives the first bullet that's fired. So what actually happened, and then the third point is improvements that we can make. So when we have to take the next hill, we can do a better job. And that's a real simple formula to analyze uh, decisions that you make and see if they worked or not. For example, out of review, out of, out of this event today, we'll do an AAR to see how it went, um, and, and we'll figure out what we can do better for next time, and that's how we've improved. And the big part of this is you got to keep doing it, and that's the iterative part, right? The council continually does this and goes through this cycle so that we can improve and look to go from good to great. Okay, so we got this in theory. So now we all love case studies, so I would love to bring up the, the beauty of being part of the RevRoad family is we have plenty of companies out there that, that go through these processes and we can see how they're doing. So we're going to bring up three of our portfolio companies here at RevRoad, and we're going to start with Parker Gentry at Skillstruck, and he's going to tell us how Skillstruck is honing in on that hedgehog concept. 
Thank you, Jason. Appreciate it. Uh, Skillstruck started in 2017 because we were passionate about this idea of how we can empower the future generation, uh, children and teenagers, with positive relationship with technology. Uh, we saw that you know screen time has such a negative connotation. How can we help the the future uh, generation be able to use technology to create, to learn, and to make an impact in the world? So we set off, and we in 2017 we we started with some summer camps, teaching kids coding. Uh, over the next 18, uh, 24 months, what we did was we did one-on-one -on -one coding tutoring. We had an online scheduling platform, uh, delivering this to families across the country. Uh, but then we even sold it as an employee benefit to companies. But at the end of the day, our company realized that we wanted to impact more children. Um, and so what we did as a company is then we pivoted again to focus on K-12 through education. And so what we do today is we sell K-12 computer science uh, curriculum and software. Um, thinking of this process, that, that's what we were passionate about. We've had the same passion this whole time. Our passion has evolved as we've interacted with more students, teachers, administrators. Um, what we've come to is what we can be best at the world at. Everything we do from a curriculum standpoint, software standpoint, falls into two buckets. Uh, first, we want to make sure that computer science is engaging and accessible for all students, especially underrepresented students. Um, but more importantly, and essentially, you know, what is the big thing that we can be good at, that we've arrived at as a council, as a company, is we can uh, really empower educators, both teachers and administrators, to implement computer science and make it sustainable. Out of all of our competitors out there, we do the best job at classroom management, at giving resources to these teachers. When we think of uh, computer science going into schools, uh, we are able to help schools that start from ground zero have a good default and a good place to start. And we help schools that have experienced teachers be able to have flexible, dynamic software and curriculum. What drives our economic engine is knowing how schools spend their money. We have a really good grasp on where we fit into school budgets. For example, we know that last year, the 2019 to 2020 school year, 125 million was spent on computer science initiatives across the country. On top of that, there were 610 million that was spent on other STEM, STEM initiatives funded by both state and federal government. So that's, uh, and then after that, uh, there was 1.2 billion that was spent on career readiness, CTE and Perkins funds. So on all of those three categories together, we know that there was over almost two billion spent last year for computer science. That, that's the, the gist of what we do. That's uh, how we've arrived to where we can be a hedgehog in this, in this uh, business world. But also, we, I just want to highlight that our team is, is amazing. And with this passion, we've been able to identify each of these core areas. Thank you. Cool. So you're going to see here, we're going to have three companies. we got some super awesome leaders that are here. So next, we're going to hear from Shari Pack from Persnickety Box. Okay. Hello. Well, I grew up um, with a scrapbooking mom, and I love photos. I love storytelling. I love memories. I love watching old home movies. And about 10 years ago, um, I found the printing processes were different as photo labs were closing, um, digital started booming, and I realized that um, a lot of companies were not printing silver halide printing, like darkroom type processing, So, um, which was very important to me that these photos lasted forever. Well, in 2010, I decided that I was going to start my own photo lab. And this is back when photo labs were closing, the market had just crashed, and People thought I was crazy. They're like, Are, is anyone even printing pictures anymore? It's a digital world now. But I went ahead and I took the risk and I bootstrapped and paid for it all on my own and opened a store called Persnickety Prints on Center Street in Orem. And this is also right across the street from Target. Super Target that had a photo lab in there. Um, cost goes down the street. But I knew that we would be the best at printing silver highlight photos. And I knew that Target... And Costco, that's not their focus. They're, the reason why they even have photo labs is to get people to walk into the store. So another benefit, too, I pulled employees from Target who were already trained to come and work with me, and I still have some of them with me today. So in looking at that, um, I didn't really realize I was living this hedgehog-type um, model, but I knew with passion that um, we could be the best at what we did. And the reason, and how could we do that with service, with speed, 
um, and with quality. We, I figured out a way to um, print photographic prints at a lower price point than Costco and Targets. And um, within three years, we, um, our revenue went to, from zero to a million and it continues to grow to this day. This year, thanks to COVID, we're up 200%. Um, and yeah, thank you, COVID. Yeah. People care about their pictures all of a sudden. Um, and um, all because we stuck to that same mentality as we want to do exactly, or what we do best. And it's kind of funny because I spent some time in camera stores. We, I don't sell cameras, I don't sell frames, I don't sell hardcover photo books because I know I can't be the best at that. So I've always kept it very simple and focused on what we do better than anybody else in the world. And we're shipping everywhere. We ship globally. Um, and it's, it amazes me that people find our little company here and order um, because they know, they know what we do. And that's kind of our focus, exactly. And we specialize in that. And we keep it very simple. Um, another great thing about being the best at something is I feel like you don't have to spend as much money in advertising. Because people will tell people. They'll share it. We've, we probably have spent over the last 10 years maybe $1,000 a year in online advertising. Because people with thanks to social media and we ask for them to share, they will happily share their experience with us because we dial it into having the best product and the best experience with this one product. So I am a living proof of the hedgehog um, idea and the whole function of being simple. Um, not knowing this um, whole idea, but I know that it works. And um, we continue to grow today because of it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Sherry. So it's probably worth saying at this point is being a fox or a hedgehog isn't inherently good or bad, right? Because you can do a lot of fox changing of strategies and uh, different tactics to get to that hedgehog concept. And in fact, uh, one of uh, the biggest examples of kind of this dichotomy is Abraham Lincoln, right? He was a hedgehog in trying to keep that union together, but he was a fox in trying to do all sorts of different things, get things through Congress, um, prosecute the Civil War in order to keep that together. So one's not inherently better than the other. The idea here is that you find that hedgehog concept and then you drive towards that. Uh, the fox part of that is try different things, but you have to be willing, like Seth said, to, to drop off what doesn't work or what doesn't fit into that concept. All right, now we're going to hear about Race Ready from Greg Call. Hey, thanks, Jason. So how many here are passionate about motorsports events? Raise your hands. Good, good. So it's pretty rare that you are able to find something that you're passionate about and can actually make a business of it as well. And do you care if I sit down? You can sit down. This leg is asleep. Oh. <laughs> sat too long in the audience. Yeah, I sat too long. <laughs> so I kind of want to tell you just a little bit about the evolution of Race Ready and how we got started because I made a mistake on the passion side. And what I did is I segmented my professional passions with my personal passions. And I shouldn't have done that. What I should have done is recognize my personal passions, which happens to be motocross racing. I've done that for over 20 years. And we don't realize the amount of knowledge that we gain with those passions and the amount of um, input that we can look into. And then, so what I was able to do is take a look at my racing background and then decide, okay, I'm passionate about this hobby, but I'm also passionate about entrepreneurship. And I wanted to build this company around that hobby. And, and I was scared to do it, honestly. And it took my son, who I was teaching entrepreneurship to, to kind of nudge me and push me in that direction. And he said, one day we were at a race and he said, hey dad, I know you want to build a software platform. This is the industry we should do it in. And it turned out that it was a pen and paper industry and it was ripe for technology to come in and, and uh, upgrade them to uh, uh, the 21st century. And so what we did is we took a look at the racing industry and we realized quite readily that it was in huge need of updates. Since it was all pen and paper, they needed online registration capabilities. They didn't have a way to score or time their events without uh, doing it manually. And so we were able to build this whole company around that passion. And so for us, that's how we, we kind of dove into it. And, and Rev Road has really been great in helping us find that hedgehog. And so what we did, we were able to take a look at that and say, hey, with racing, here's this economic engine we have. 
now we marry those two together. Now I have my professional passions and my personal passions in a perfect marriage. And we're able to make that come to fruition. And so by doing that, we're able to take on four beta clients at this point, process almost a million dollars worth of volume through this platform, and we're continuing to grow and being successful at it. And so I think that was the biggest thing for me to learn in this exercise was don't segment and discount your personal passions and focus just on your professional passions. Try to marry those two together because there's a wealth of knowledge there and the opportunity could be right under your nose because it was under my nose for over 20 years as a racer. So there you go. Appreciate Thanks, that. Greg. Okay, so you can see there, uh, that's about that passion play, um, and you need to, but you need to have all those three circles where they intersect in order to make it work, right? Because I, like, I have a passion for doing home improvement projects, but I know I cannot be the best in the world at that. I can't do drywall if my life depended on it, and so nobody's going to give me money for that. So, um, but if you can turn your passion and marry it up with those things like Greg was talking about, that's where you can discover your hedgehog. Okay. So uh, let's boil it down, and the point is this, okay? And, and Wharton School of Business came up with this. Great companies become great by staying focused. They're focused on their products, their customers, and their businesses. They aspire to higher levels of excellence, are never content, content to become complacent, and are passionate about their products. They have leadership that is not ego-driven and have organizational cultures that embrace constant change, because that's really what we're talking about. Um, I did some research on this, uh, looking at these good to great companies, and some of these great companies that Jim Collins cited aren't around anymore, like Circuit City. Most of you probably don't remember Circuit City. But so what happened, and, and my thought is that they just kind of lost sight of that iterative process where they got to keep changing because market forces change, leadership changes, um, COVID happens. So you do have to take these things into account and adjust that hedgehog as uh, market, market forces dictate. So one of the other things that Jim Collins brought up in his book is that a lot of people think that the enemy of the great is bad, but what he said is the enemy of the great is the good. Because once we get a good company or once we get to a good level, we're, we're good, right? We don't, we're, we're good, we just kind of stay there. So we become complacent. And I found this quote by John D. Rockefeller, one of the you know, original entrepreneurs, don't be afraid to give up the good to go for the great, because that's that fear of going for it sometimes is what holds us back. So that's my presentation on foxes and hedgehogs. Hopefully you're thinking about that. Um, we do have, I think, two questions, time for two questions that we can take right now. And if you have a question for Seth back there or for Shari, Greg, and Parker, we'd love to take it now. If I explained it so well that there's no questions, then I'll turn the time back over to Darren. Thanks.